Sir Callahan is the one to see. Call 387 LA filing number 16-7970. WNXX, Jackson, KNXX, Donaldsonville, and WDGLHD2 Baton Rouge. This hour brought to you by Spencer Callahan Injury Lawyers. LA 21-12681. Offices in Baton Rouge. Show. You are now listening to the Hunt Palmer Show on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Locking down the middle of the day. Live from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge Studios, this is Hunt Palmer. Hunt Palmer coming to you from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge Studio downtown in the capital city. On this Tuesday, means we're brought to you by Pluckers Wing Bar. Got Jacob Beck and Jordan Kitchens back there on the ones and twos. Appreciate you for being with us. Hope your work week is off to a good start. Not necessarily the rosiest of rundowns here on this Tuesday. Um, we are going to talk a little bit of Saints uh, and some of what they can do on the offensive line. Uh, Glenn West will be with us uh, from Go 24-7. We'll talk some LSU baseball with Glenn. Joe Sloan, LSU offensive coordinator, met with the media earlier today. and We've got some sound from that that we'll get to in this hour. LSU baseball just horrendous last night in a loss to Southern. We'll talk about that. Matthew Bruni at 2.15. Talk LSU and Iowa and what's next for the LSU women's basketball team. Sharif Ishak at 2.30. Oh, by the way, the Pels lost last night too. So not a super rosy a couple of days here in South Louisiana for sports, but... We're here to talk about all of it here on the Hunt Palmer Show and appreciate you being with us. We start today with LSU and Iowa last night. Iowa advances to the Final Four with a 94-87 to win. This game was not decided because of unfair seeding by the selection committee. It was not decided because of Iowa's hot start. It was not decided because Angel Reese got hurt. It wasn't decided because Haley Van Lith played defense some, and last year Poa played defense some, and you didn't have a ton of flage on Haley, on Caitlin Clark. This game was decided very simply by watching the game because one of these teams had Caitlin Clark and the other one did not. I want to be abundantly clear. This is in no way, shape, or form a shot at, or any chance to denigrate LSU's women's basketball team. The defending national champs from last year, you cannot take that away from Angel Reese, from Flage, from Kim Mulkey. They had a great year this year. There were some bumps. Yeah, you had a terrible injury to Samaya Smith, and Terry Poole was let go, and you had a bumpy go there where Auburn got you, and Mississippi State got you, and it wasn't perfect, but it was a good year. And they got through the opening round, and they played well in the Sweet 16. Finished that game exceptionally strong against a good UCLA team. And LSU is going to be really good next year. No matter what Angel Reese decides to do, or Haley Van Lith decides to do. Flage is going to be a star. Michaela Williams is going to be a star. This is nothing to do with how good LSU's women's basketball team is. They are very good. Caitlin Clark clearly separated herself from the other nine players on the floor last night. I'm watching that game, and she's doing everything for Iowa on offense. And there's just not a lot LSU could have done to offset it. She's too good a passer. She's too good a shooter. She's too good a decision maker. She's just better than everybody else on the floor. And that sucks to admit when you feel like you've got an elite program and you've got pride in your school. I'm watching it last night. But do you think a lot of opposing teams were really ticked off at their players last year when Paul Skeens was striking out 17 and throwing 100 miles an hour and mowing everybody down? No, he's just better than you. Do you think everybody was just super cranky with their team's performance when Joe Burrow was lighting it up like a Christmas tree? No. No. He's better than you. 
she was better than LSU. We'll see if she gets it all the way home. LSU beat her last year. Feather in the cap. Heck of an effort. It took going bananas offensively from the three-point line, but hey, sometimes it happens. Kaylin Clark's just too good last night as I dropped my phone on the floor. Like, you realize in this game, Iowa made 32 field goals. Kaitlin Clark made 13 of them and assisted on 12. That's 25 of 32. Statistically, this game is not wildly different. LSU was 34 of 88. Iowa was 32 of 69. LSU made more field goals. Iowa made five more threes, which you could have expected. Iowa got to the free throw line a little bit more. They did some of that at the end of the game when LSU was fouling and the game was decided. It wasn't like LSU was horrendous from turnovers. They had 13 of them. Iowa had 12. And look, Iowa came out smoking. Hit four of their first five threes and were playing great. But LSU, to their credit, stood right up to them. And that was largely due to Angel Reese just taking over. It was an incredible play she makes with the steal and goes coast to coast. She was owning the offensive glass. In the first quarter, Angel Reese comes out, 10 points, 5 rebounds. She was so good in the first quarter. I mean, extrapolate that out. That's 40 points and 20, 20 rebounds. But Angel Reese, because of the position that she plays, can really only, for 40 minutes, dominate about eight feet of the floor. And LSU did that. They dominated that eight feet of the floor. LSU had 23 offensive rebounds. Iowa had six. But Angel Reese can dominate eight feet right around the rim. And that's a huge piece to a basketball team. Caitlin Clark dominates the entire floor. She's great in transition. She's great passing. LSU doesn't have players on its team that are throwing those 50-foot touch passes in stride to players for layups. Nobody's pulling up from 35 feet and splat floor. And as a competitor, like if you're a lower-level program and you're a 15 seed and you're playing a two and there's somebody you just can't handle, like that's just part of it. It's hard to to come to grips with that when you're an elite-level program and you see it. That's what I saw last night. Credit to LSU for, for fighting. I thought after the first quarter, LSU was going to win. I said, I was making all these threes, and it's they're high, they're high difficulty level shots, and LSU is getting it right to the rim, getting rebounds on the glass, dominating the paint. That's more sustainable than bombs away. But I was wrong because in the third quarter, Iowa kept the pedal to the metal, and LSU absolutely stalled. In the third quarter alone, LSU was 0 of 5 from three-point range, but 5 of 26 from the floor. I don't know that the LSU took too many threes in the third quarter. They took five. Do I need Poa taking those threes? They were wide open, but probably not. I'd rather get the ball inside. But LSU shot five threes and 21 twos. They just went 5 of 21 on the twos. To me, there were a few more, few too many 15-footers, but in the women's game, there are a lot of 15-footers taken. Women are are high-percentage shooters from 15 feet, and once you get into the weeds, sometimes it can be difficult to get shots off. Where guys can kind of attack at the rim, it's not as easy, obviously, so you shoot a lot of 12-footers. LSU makes a ton of 12-footers. I mean, last year, Angel Reese was awesome from 12 feet. This year, good from 12 feet, better around the rim, but like Anissa Morrow, that's a she's a really good mid-range jump shooter. Haley Van Lith is a good mid-range, mid-range jump shooter. Sometimes Flage gets into those. We've seen Michaela Williams shoot those as well. They just missed them a lot in the third quarter, and Iowa didn't because Caitlin Clark did what she does, and she went four of seven from the three-point range, and she dissed out three assists in that quarter. And in that quarter, it completely got away from LSU, and they couldn't come back. You look at the other three quarters— in the first quarter, LSU won it by five points. In the second quarter, you lost it by five points. You you tied in the first half. And in the fourth quarter, LSU won the fourth quarter by four points, even fouling Iowa at the end of the game. But you could not come back from a 11-point defeat 
in the third quarter where it was 24 to 13. I was so impressed with Caitlin Clark last night. Her quickness, her ability to get to spots on the floor, her vision, her ability to sense tempo. She did take that one shot that she always takes, that Steph Curry always takes, where you've hit a couple of threes, you come down, it's in transition, you shoot it from 40 feet. I think it's ridiculous, but but that's that's part of their game. And she was just that good last night. And yeah, I wish Angel would not have rolled her ankle. And yeah, I wish they would have tried something else defensively. But I just don't see anyone that plays for LSU that's going to have the ability to slow Caitlin Clark down to the degree it's going to take. And we know, based on Patrick Wright on the show yesterday with Charles Hanegriff, and we know based on kind of what has been said about last year's national championship game, the plan for Caitlin Clark is to keep her in front of you and make her score over the top. Don't let her get by you, get into rotation where she's good finishing at the rim and even better distributing to her teammates. And she did get into the into, into the paint and make things happen. She's awesome. And I hate with a passion the term generational talent. Because when you say that, you're telling me that this person doesn't come around but every 25 years. And that is very often not the case. I think people will say that with like Hagen Smith this year at Arkansas. Like, he's not. Arkansas always has really good pitchers. Caitlin Clark. That looks like a generational talent to me for Iowa basketball. All right. And that's just, that is way good. And uh, you know, LSU played a pretty good game last night. Like sometimes you go out there in an NCAA tournament and you just lay an egg, and it is hard to swallow that that 40 minutes of your entire season is what stopped it. I don't feel that way for LSU's women. I didn't watch every dribble this year, but I watched the games that got the most pub. I thought LSU played just fine last night. I thought they were just fine. Kaylin Clark was better. And that was what it boiled down to on the floor in Albany last night. So I will move on to the Final Four. Now LSU moving into what's next. And for Angel Reese and Haley Van Lith, they've got two days to decide what they're going to do. We'll talk to Matthew Bruni about it coming up in, in hour number two. My um, sincere belief is that, Haley, that, uh, is that Angel Reese has played her last college basketball game. She gave a lengthy answer last night in the press conference about how the brand that she's built with her Reebok shoe contract and the Instagram followers and what she can do moving forward, that money is going to follow her wherever she needs to go. It's not necessarily plugged into Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I think she's going to going to move on and see what's next. Haley Van Lith, I don't know. I don't know what she's going to do. Um, Kim Mulkey said last night that she has not had conversations with them, that she's not necessarily one that wants to get involved in those personal decisions. She said both are welcomed back, and she would love to have them. However, we'll just have to see what they decide to do, and then LSU will pivot from there on what they want to do with their women's basketball team. But there's no doubt in my mind that they'll field another very, very good team, and that they'll be right back in the thick of this thing next year at this time. Caitlin Clark won't be playing for Iowa at that point, and that's good news for those of us here in Baton Rouge. Tigers lose it last night by the final score of 94-87. to We'll talk more about it with Matthew Bruning coming up in hour number two. Our uh, Tuesday show is brought to you by Pluckers Wing Bar. Nicholson just south of campus, Mall, Louisiana. Um, on Blue Bonnet, two fantastic locations. Want to watch some uh, some hoops this weekend? Want to watch some LSU baseball this weekend? Or just eat some delicious jumbo chicken wings and drink some awesome craft beer? Pluckers is your spot. Two locations here in Baton Rouge, and we appreciate them bringing you our shows each and every Tuesday. All right, I did not want to get into LSU baseball right after the LSU women's basketball season has ended. It's just too depressing for, for two segments in a row. So what we're going to do here is we're going to talk a little Saints and, and what they can potentially do on the offensive line, some rumors that are swirling about some veterans that could be available in free agency. We'll get to Glenn West to go 24-7 later on in the hour. And, of course, Joe Sloan, LSU offensive coordinator, met with the media today. We'll do that at the end of the hour as well. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show. You are now listening to The Hunt Palmer Show. Visit us at LaBerge Baton Rouge Casino this weekend for all the hoops action. We've got the biggest screens, the best food and drink, plus giving away pin cash bonuses and prizes to Pin Play Rewards members. Not a member? Well, that's easy. You can join today by downloading and registering for the Pin Play app from the App Store. Unlock all the fun, including a chance to win up to $2,000 
in pen cash. All this and more. Make LaBerge Baton Rouge Casino your March and April sports viewing headquarters. Must be 21 or older. Gaming problem? Call 100 4700 our listeners fire up their opinions on the jimsfirearms.net hotline at 499-1045. Keep listening for your next chance to shoot us your thoughts with the jimsfirearms.net hotline on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. to start dancing in the desert. It's the 2024 NCAA Men's Final Four in Phoenix. Tune in for live coverage starting Saturday afternoon at 3. From the team at Westwood One right here on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Listening to the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Plucker's Wing Bar. Glenn West, along to talk some LSU baseball and spring football here in about 12 minutes. Let's talk some Saints. I think everyone is aware uh, after the news of Ryan Ramchek being iffy, is that fair to say? Uh, iffy a couple of weeks ago with that nagging knee. The Saints now have two tackle positions to address. Doesn't mean replace Ramchek, but you certainly have to address that position. What is Ramchek's probability? What can you do to help offset that if he's not there? And then what are you doing at left tackle? And I, I just don't imagine that Trevor Penning is part of the plans. So you've got some options. And the first one, which is not super, you know, fascinating or oh, that's interesting, or I hadn't thought about that, is the obvious, and it's Andrews Pete. What can you do to bring him back? And that's something that I've said a couple times that I think should be a priority 
for the New Orleans Saints. I think Pete was fine last year at tackle. I think um, that he's a guy that you can bring in for the right price and then try to address some things in the draft, but he's a, he's a stopgap. He can also swing around and play some other spots for you. Versatility, key, especially at the offensive line where injuries rack up. Like Depending on the price, I think Andrews Pete makes some sense. But there are some other names that are still free agents that I think makes some sense for some other reasons. Donovan Smith is one. He's 31 years old. He played tackle for the Chiefs this past year, a lot of time at left tackle. Um, he was with Tampa from 2015 to 2022. He's 31 years old. And Donovan Smith's most impressive characteristic has been his verse, his basically his availability. His durability is the number I was looking for. If you look back over his time in the NFL, he started as a 22-year-old tackle for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And in 2015, he played 100% of the offensive snaps. The next year in 2016, 100% of the offensive snaps. The next year in 2017, 97%. 2018, 100%. Three of his first four years in the league played 100%. The other time before that, 97%. But you keep going. 99% in 19. 96% in 2020. 97% in 2021. 96% in 2022. He never dipped below 96% of the offensive snaps Tampa played for his first seven years in the NFL. That's impressive to me. Now Tampa decided they were going to move on. They got a little younger at offensive line. And Kansas City swooped in at his thir year 30 season and said, come on in, play for us. And he did miss some time, but he played 92% of the offensive snaps for Kansas City this past year. I don't know that Donovan Smith is going to command a massive deal. He's never been you know, a you know Pro Bowl type guy. He's never been an all pro type guy. He's just been a solid, available, experienced, professional tackle in the National Football League. That is something the Saints can absolutely use. Again, this is all price dependent, but that's someone I would look at. On the other side of things, if you're not looking for someone in their age 31 season and maybe looking for someone who could be a piece of your organization longer term, not suggesting Donovan Smith doesn't have four or five years left in him, maybe he does. But Mekhi Becton, in terms of his age, definitely does. Now, Mekhi Becton in the 2020 draft was the 11th pick by the Jets. But he has not lived up to the 11th pick in the draft standard. He has missed basically an entire season in 2021. And last year was okay in a completely dysfunctional Jets offense. He's an elite level athlete, test numbers through the roof, and he's 25. Now... I am not interested at all in the New Orleans Saints walking up to Mekhi Becton and offering him some sort of five-year deal that ends up in cap, kick it down the road, hell, and ties up more money for the franchise long-term. Here's how I would like to approach Mekhi Becton if that's the guy. Hey, Mekhi, one-year prove-it deal. One year, probably the most money you're going to see on the table. But let's see it. Not a five-year deal, not a four-year deal, not even a three-year deal for me, for Mekhi Becton, based on his performance thus far. You want to come here in one year, you're not going to age yourself out of the league if you come here and play your year 25 season for New Orleans. You'll either prove to a second team that you're not worth another shot, which could be detrimental, or you will prove yourself as worthy We'll come back to the table and renegotiate you with you. At that point, we'll know more about where Andrews Pete is. We'll know far more about where Trevor Penning is, and we'll know more about where Ryan Ramchick is. And at that point, we've got to figure some things out. We may have a first-round draft pick we love that we don't need you, or we may really need you and have found something in your play in this system. I'm not really holding much against Jets offensive players over the last three years. It's not been great. It's not easy to block when you've got Zach Wilson back there chucking the pigskin, okay? Defensive coordinators can get a little more creative knowing he's probably not going to burn you. 
And that's not an easy place to play as an offensive lineman. He might be a terrible player. Not my job to assess it. I'm just, he might be good. And you may not have been able to tell as a member of the Jets. So if the Saints can spend a little money here on Mekhi Becton, I would be okay with that. You've got to address this position. This is not a luxury. You throw a bunch of money at a, a running back, I think you, you're, you're looking at a luxury here. The Saints have to address offensive line. And I would love it if they went in, in, to Mekhi Becton and said, hey, one-year prove-it deal. I don't know if he'd be up for that or not, but I think it's advantageous for the Saints. I don't want the Saints doing anything to tie up money for 25, 26, 27. That, to me, is foolish. It was fine when Breeze and Peyton were there. We've had this discussion 400,000 times. It's not now. There is too much uncertainty with this franchise to be tying up money. I think most people who are breaking down the New Orleans Saints would suggest that a little bit of a regression is going to be needed to become an elite franchise. They may not say that on airline in in Metairie. Mickey Loomis may not say that. Dennis Allen sure as heck isn't going to say that. I don't know what Gail Benson thinks, Jeff Ireland. I, I, I don't know what, what they think. But most of us who are on the outside are looking at this thing going, you know what? This is probably going to have to get a little bit worse. And when you're going to try to get better after it gets worse, you need money and draft picks to make it better. And if you start signing offensive tackles to four-year deals, well, it's going to have money tied up. That's why I love the Chase Young signing. That's why I want Mekhi Becton for one year or Donovan Smith for a year or two. I wouldn't be over just furious if you gave Donovan Smith a two-year contract. At least he plays. At least he's a proven pro. Is he going to be the first team all pro? No, but he's a pro. Those are the type of deals that I'm interested in New Orleans making. They've got to do something there, and we assume they're going to do something in the draft. But these make a little bit of sense to me. It starts with Pete. He's somebody that's proven in your in your in your locker room, shown you he can play multiple positions. Not going to be a Pro Bowler, but fine. Donovan Smith, that's a guy who you can depend on to at least go out there and play, which you can't do for Trevor Penning or Ryan Ramchick right now. And then Mekhi Becton would be a swing at a high upside guy who's young in his career. There's a world where Mekhi Becton is a Saints offensive tackle for the next five years, six years. There's a world where you find out in the middle of September that he can't play. But if you find that out, Best not to have a lot of money tied up into it. The market dictates all this, and I don't have that information as to know what kind of offers will be on the table. But that's just, from a, from a, a pro-Saints perspective, an ideal Saints perspective, that's kind of what I'd like to see. Fascinated to see what the Saints do on the offensive line, specifically at tackle, as we move forward here. If you're looking for our Saints uh, content, you can catch it on YouTube. Hunt on Saints. All your Saints content all year long goes right there to that YouTube channel there chopped up into 10-minute, very digestible uh, segments. Our full-time shows, or our full shows, are uh, uploaded each day every as well uh, on the Hunt Palmer Show. So go and check all of that out. Uh, just just an awful night for LSU baseball at the box last night. Uh, Glenn West was there, and he'll uh, break it down next for us on the Hunt Palmer Show. The Hunt Palmer Show. Platinum Window Tint. Platinum Window Tint LLC.com. Again, that website, Platinum Window Tint LLC.com. You know, you could potentially get a tax credit for tinting your windows at your home or your business. Could, because you're saving energy. And when you save energy, you save some money as well. We know those really, really high AC bills are on the horizon here. Maybe you can mitigate some of those, depending on your sun exposure, how much window space you have. Let the folks from Platinum Window Tent come out, assess that, and get that done for you. It's not just automobiles. They do automobiles, and that can help you stay a little bit cooler in those automobiles as well. But they also do homes and businesses. They've worked on our building here at Guarantee in our third floor conference room. You can tell a difference in there. Let the folks at Platinum Window Tent come out to your home or your business and see what they can do for you. Check them out online. You can request a free quote and see the list of services they have. Check out their ceramic coating as well. It can really protect your car. It's all right there at PlatinumWindowTentLLC.com. 
In times of need, get a full list of phone numbers, websites, and other important emergency information on the Demco Stormwatch page at 1045ESPN.com. Bench with Jacob Hester and T. Bob Abear. Mornings from 7 to 10 on 1045 ESPN Baton Rouge. This is the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Plucker's Wing Bar. Glenn West, our guy from Go 24-7, senior writer over there is with us every Tuesday. Joins us now on the Gym's Firearms Hotline. Glenn, how are you? Oh, I'm doing okay, Hunt. How about yourself? <laughs> I'm doing all right. Not a lot of uh, sunshine and roses to be pumped today, but that's all right. Uh, we'll find yeah. a way. Um, look, let's talk baseball at the end. Uh, I want to start with football. Um, you were able to go out and check out practice a couple times since we last spoke. Um, anything that has uh, caught your eye that we can maybe pick at? Uh, well, uh, nothing really has caught the eye. I mean, we've, we've had a couple of 20 minute sessions, uh, over the last couple, over the last week or so. Uh, I would say probably just the consistency and kind of the rotations they've been running out offensively. Um, you know, it's pretty much stuck with Kyron Lacey, Chris Hilton, Aaron Anderson, uh, as your first team receivers, Josh Williams as your first team running back. And, uh, Mason Taylor is your first team tight end. So that's been a uh, pretty consistent rotation. You know, we had a chance to talk with uh, Joe Sloan today, the offensive coordinator for LSU. And uh, he just, he raved about just the, the steps that a lot of these guys have taken this year. 
uh, particularly somebody like Kyron, who you know got to watch Malik and, and Brian Thomas these last couple of years really ascend uh, you know, in their games. And I, I think he, he expects Kyron to, to take, uh, not, I wouldn't say maybe as big a leap, but, but definitely, uh, a leap here to where, you know, he can be a for, uh, formidable, uh, wide receiver one kind of player for LSU in the SEC next year. What are your th- expectations for Aaron Anderson? Yeah, uh, he's definitely going to be in that kind of grouping of, uh, slot receivers, guys that they want to get the ball to and, 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 in space and may, let him make some plays. Uh, he kind of, Joe Sloan today kind of lumped Anderson and Kyle Parker and Xavion Thomas all into the kind of the same grouping of, of guys that they really want to uh, get the ball to uh, in terms of like screens and, um, you know, just, just different ways they're going to be able to kind of utilize their, their speed offensively. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think you know, Anderson kind of has to prove to a lot of folks is just that he can stay on the field, that he can be healthy, that he can, um, you know, also be able to kind of uh, learn this offense. I mean, I think there were some times last year where maybe he, he struggled to see the field early in the season because he was still trying to pick things up. And obviously when you have a, a, a group like neighbors and, and Thomas and Lacey that really kind of established themselves as the top three guys, they're really, wasn't a whole lot of opportunity, I think, as the season wore on for Anderson. So this is his big off season, I think, for him as he's, you know, as he's as he's had in college, and um, you know, it'll be very interesting to see kind of where he factors in. But I definitely feel like he's kind of pegged for that slot role. Uh, maybe he can factor in uh, on special teams, but he's been a very consistent, you know, part of the the first team offense here so far this spring. Are there any catches available for Shelton Sampson? Uh, well. Funny you mention him. I mean, Shelton Sampson was not asked about by Joe Sloan, uh, you know, was not asked about to Joe Sloan today. And, and kind of the last quote that Joe Sloan gave to us was about Shelton Sampson and about some of the big plays he's been making here recently in the last week or two. And, and you know, they feel like maybe he's starting to take a little bit of a turn. Here. We lose Glenn. I think we lost Glenn there. We dropped. I uh, was talking about Shelton Sampson. That's good news, though. To hear that Far, Shelton Sam- Oh, there he uh, is. Glenn, we yeah. lost you for a second there, but we got you back. Oh, oh, my bad. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, he's, um, yeah, they they, they, they they really like Shelton. I mean, I, we were talking with Joe Sloan today, and we didn't even get a chance to bring him up. Um, but Joe Sloan kind of did at the very end, at the tail end of his press conference. So, uh, and he talked about some of the big catches that Shelton's been making the last week or two. Uh, they feel like he may be turning a corner, so... Uh, definitely somebody to keep an eye on uh, you know, as spring kind of winds down here over the next couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, he's been pretty consistently in that second, third team grouping uh, that we've been able to see at practice so far. On the defensive side of things, Jordan Gilbert, how has he uh, assimilated coming over from Texas A&M? Yeah, he's been really good. I mean, he's, I think, going to be one of your two deep safeties next to, um, you know, next to Sage Ryan. It really looks like they've kind of pegged Major Burns in that star role closer to the line of scrimmage where he can – uh, you know, you'd hope make some tackles and make some big plays for you around the line of scrimmage. But uh, Gilbert's been a very long, athletic. Uh, you know, uh, kind of he's a lot bigger when you watch him just you know in practice and you're up close and personal with him and get to see him. Uh, he's really tall. He's really lengthy. Guy that I think has some some really good speed to him as well. And so I think he's going to be a huge part of what they do uh, defensively in that safety room. Uh, Sage Ryan's been making a ton of plays back there as well. Uh, I think they feel good about the safety spot right now and just kind of the guys that they're going to be rotating in and out. Uh, but I would keep an eye on somebody like Deshaun McBride. I think he's a true freshman that was one of the higher-ranked signings out of the class. Uh, I think he's making some big early waves here in in, uh, in spring camp as well. Where does Sage Ryan fit in? I realize he's going to play, but I mean, if you got Major Burns back there yeah. and Gilbert back there, like where's Sage? Where's the spot? Yeah, so the way that they've kind of structured this thing up is, you know, they've had two high safeties, two safeties that are deep in the deep part of the field, and it's been Gilbert and Ryan that have been the two deep safeties, at least from what we've seen uh, in spring ball so far. Uh, they've had Major Burns playing this this star role. It's kind of a mixture between like a hybrid, you know, uh, you know, kind of nickel role, and also a little bit of kind of what Harold was doing last year. Uh, at the Sam linebacker position. So they've got, you know, Mer- Major Burns closer to the line of scrimmage, which was something that uh, I know that Brian Kelly wanted to try to do last year. But, um, yeah, they've had Sage back there with, with Jarden as kind of the two deep safeties. 
All right, let's transition to foot, uh, baseball. Um, <laughs> All right. What did you see in the Arkansas series? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I thought that they were they were competitive in all three of those games. They had chances to win uh, a couple of those, especially that, that Friday game. I feel like that was one that you go back and you look back at the season as a whole, that's one they're going to wish they had gotten back and had been able to kind of finish off, especially with the way that Griffin Herring was pitching over those last three or four innings. They just – they could not find any consistency at the plate, you know, down the stretch of that game. And that's been a common theme for this team, unfortunately, for a good part of the SEC schedule is that they just, uh, they can get guys on base, but they are wildly inconsistent in bringing them home. Uh, and you saw that again last night in the Southern game as well, but just, uh, yeah, a lot of inconsistencies really across the roster. I think the bullpen is something that, you know, you're really going to have to look at hard if you're Jay Johnson in terms of major shakeups and, who you want to rely on in certain spots. That's the way that Jay kind of described it to, to us yesterday, uh, is they're, they're at ground zero. They're back to ground zero in terms of just uh, you know, character and competitiveness and concentration and focus. Uh, all that stuff has kind of really been a, a huge downturn, I think, for the team in these last couple of weeks. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the Arkansas series is one that you were hoping they would maybe steal one game, but, fact that they kind of got swept there and you're sitting at two and seven in league play uh there's really no room for error going forward with this group yeah what did you take away from those comments about being at ground zero in the the i mean do you think there's a team chemistry issue uh it certainly sounds like it Uh, just in terms of talking with jay yesterday i mean that was as disgruntled as i've seen him in the three years i've been covering that team i mean he was uh you could tell very frustrated in terms of just you know, what what they're not getting out of the guys right now. And I think he has a lot of belief in them. He has a lot of faith that they can uh, turn this thing around. But um, right now the proof's in the pudding. And so far this team has just not been good. And they, 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 they just have not been able to get out of their own way, I think, in a lot of respects. You know, they had three errors last night, um, you know, a couple that led to some big insurance runs for Southern when the game was kind of tight there in the end. Um, and then offensively, they went two for 23 with runners on, one for 13 with runners in scoring position. Um, you're, you're against the Southern team that you would like to see that uh, not be a narrative that continues. Um, you know, they, they, they just they just they, they they failed in a lot of aspects yesterday, and that's that's something that's been common, I think, with with the way that they've kind of had a mindset and their approach. Uh, you know, Jay brought up the word character yesterday with us a couple of different times. Um, I think there's a lot that's going on right now there that they have to kind of get figured out. How do you think they line up the starting rotation against Vanderbilt being it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday again this week? Yeah, I, you know, I honestly couldn't tell you. I mean, I I think Thatcher heard, you know, pitching yesterday gives you some indication that he's probably not going to be in a, in a starting position. So I would imagine that they probably uh, go with, you know, uh, Javen Coleman again, possibly in that first game. I, I could see them moving, Coleman and jump up Thursday and Friday, uh, and then having some kind of you know bullpen game on on, on Saturday. So um, I, I think you know one of those two options is going to be where it's at. But I do think you're probably looking at Javen Coleman again getting a start. Um, you know whether it's the Thursday game or the Saturday game, and uh, you put Jump and, and Holman in there. You know as you see fit. Got to start winning some ball games. Thanks, Glenn. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Hunt. Appreciate it. Glenn West, senior writer of Go 24-7. Spring football, they got you covered. Recruiting, they got you covered. Baseball, basketball, they got you covered everywhere at uh, Go 24-7. We appreciate Glenn for coming on. Joe Sloan met with the media, talked about his quarterbacks. We'll do that coming up next. You are now listening to the Hunt Palmer Show. Audio, video, security, solutions, avssla.com is the website. Look, homeowners insurance, not a lot of fun in South Louisiana. You You can get a credit. If you've got an alarm that's monitored with cameras, Audio Video Security Solutions can help you with that. It's right there in the name, Audio Video Security Solutions. Got an app, pull it up right there on your phone 24 hours a day. You can stream the camera or cameras that are outside your house. You can play back. You can record. It's always recording. It's a huge help to us. I can deactivate or activate the alarm from being inside the house or outside the house. We appreciate the work that Audio Video Security Solutions did over at our house and very much what it recommend them doing the same to yours. Mitchell Fisher's cell phone. He's the owner of the company. They're based right here in Baton Rouge, 225-439-7920. 
Again, in the 225 area code, 439-7920. Get them on Instagram, A-V-S-S underscore B-R. You can see tons of great pictures and videos of their awesome work that they've done around our listening area. It's Audio Video Security Solutions. Check them out online, avssla.com. Our listeners fire up their opinions on the gymsfirearms.net hotline at 499-1045. Keep listening for your next chance to shoot us your thoughts with the gymsfirearms.net hotline on 1045 ESPN Baton Rouge. Join us for the Tuesday edition of Live at Lunch from Mike Anderson Seafood, Wesley at Nicholson. Andy Isco joins us from Las Vegas. Todd Graffinini, voice of the Pels, and Buzzy Heidel with us to talk LSU baseball. Live at Lunch, 11 a.m. Tuesday on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Plucker's Wing Bar. Just seeing a lot of growth, right? I think, you know, the big thing coming into this offseason was about developing our identity as an offense um, and really trying to start that from inside out. Right? Every, everything's got to start from inside out, from the offensive line out to the perimeter. Um, and we want to be known as a physical football team that's explosive on the perimeter. And I, I think as, you, as, as we watch throughout spring practice, a lot of those things have been showing up. That's Joe Sloan, LSU's new offensive coordinator. Of course, been the quarterback coach here for a couple of seasons, developed a Heisman Trophy winner in Jaden Daniels, and now will take over the reins of the entire offense. But I think you know, for Joe, the, the thing that he loves the most is, is coaching the quarterback, 
politics and it's what he grew up in in this business and certainly he's got added responsibility now but that time with the quarterbacks from the starter all the way down the line is something that I know that he he takes a lot of pride in and enjoys a lot and his starting quarterback is going to be Garrett Nussmeyer and I think from a physical perspective Garrett's got a lot of tools and I think from a leadership perspective he's growing into some of the things that he's he's had for a long time and Jocelyn met with the media today and talked about Garrett Nussmeyer stepping into the leadership role of the offense. When all of a sudden Garrett got his opportunity in the bowl game, you could see him step into that role and, and the relationships that he had built over time, the work that he had put in, um, guys respect that. They respect work and they respect if they know you care about your teammates and they respect guys who are going to go out and do their job to the absolute best of their ability. Um, and I think that's how Garrett's uh, stepped in and maybe taking advantage of his, of his new role. So it's been it's been really good to watch, but I think his vocal leadership has really grown, but I think he's playing within himself. So it'll it'll be fun. we got... A lot of work to do between now and August, but a lot of really good things so far. I've um, I've been around or covered some coaches' sons here at LSU. Certainly, Kramer comes to to mind immediately, and so does Joe Burrow come to mind uh, immediately. And there there are a number of of coaches' sons and daughters that have have come through here that I've I've observed. Hal Hughes was not a star on the baseball team, but it came from a coaching background. And there's something about that upbringing that I think lends itself to leadership and responsibility and doing the right things. It's not 100% of the time, but I just feel like it is. And I think Garrett is going to be a really, really good leader for the offense. And he's going to be the starting quarterback of this group. The question is, who is an immediate backup? And Ricky Collins and A.J. Swan are kind of fighting for that spot. Joe Sloan spoke to Ricky Collins' development. He's really getting to his backside, and when he gets to his backside, he's in rhythm. And when he's in rhythm, he does some really good things. Um, really playing quarterback, right? He's he's just starting to manage the game, uh, manage the play, go where the ball's supposed to go, where the, you know what I mean, where the defense tells us it's supposed to go, delivering it on time, and just seeing a lot of growth in that standpoint, as well as he is, he's a passionate guy, um, and, and that's something that we love about him, and making sure that he keeps that passion to where – the guys will follow him. And I think just his growth and maturity um, and experience within the offense, but I've been really excited about uh, the last several days that he's had. Ricky's a pretty talented dude. Um, you know, was right here from the st- uh, city of Baton Rouge, has a pretty big arm, decent size, can run a little bit. I don't know if any of the attributes jump off the page, but he's kind of gotten that whole pack. He just had not played any football here uh, in Baton Rouge. A.J. Swan has played some football in the Southeastern Conference at Vanderbilt, and I think was brought in not necessarily to compete with Garrett Nussmeyer, but to one, give some experience to the backup position, and two, to create some competition with Ricky Collins. So Joe Sloan spoke to the Vanderbilt transfer. Obviously played a lot of football, and we do a lot of things on offense. And when he's comfortable, he's been really, really good delivering the ball on time. He has a really quick release. You know, when he's not comfortable, and that's the biggest thing for him. And you go back to even a couple couple springs ago when you got new guys in the offense, right? When we had all the new quarter, all the quarterbacks in a new offense, it's a lot, right? So I gotta be I gotta be sharp mentally, and I gotta know the assignments. When I do that, then it can come out uh, who I am as a player. When he's doing that, he's really, really good delivering the football on time. Um, and that's what he's just got to continue to grow within the offense, uh, and that'll be huge for him over the next several, you know, couple months. Look, I, any statistics you roll up playing in this current Vanderbilt football program, I'm just going to kind of toss out. It's just a losing battle to go out there and try to play behind no offensive line with very few weapons against the best league in the country. The fact is that A.J. Swan has seen some of that. He's prepared as a starting quarterback. He's seen some of the environments in the SEC, and, and I think he's got the inside track to be the backup quarterback on this team. I, d- I don't know that he necessarily steps up and, and tries to supplant Garrett Nussmeyer. I do think he gives you a nice insurance policy. In this day and age in college football, isn't that really all you can ask for? Your backups are not going to stick around that long. Garrett Nussmeyer is a bit of an outlier. Guys just don't stick around that long to be backup quarterbacks. So to have a guy with some experience as a backup, I think, is a very positive thing for LSU. Colin Hurley is the last guy in in this number. Uh, he reclassified, as we know, and has entered early from college. So he th- he should be... <laughs> He should be in his junior year of college right now. That's a crazy thought. But he's here, and Joe Sloan spoke to his development as a very young player. Colin Hurley has the talent that we thought, right? When guys come in, you kind of say, okay, what kind of talent level do they have? And we're, we're, right, we're excited about where Colin's at. 
the talent level he has. And I think you've seen some improvements from an accuracy standpoint uh, that are showing up consistently. The big thing is, right, when you're a freshman coming in, I don't care where you're from, what high school you play at, it doesn't matter. When you're a freshman coming in, everything's going really, really fast. What's been really positive is even as things are going really fast, he, he's able to see space um, and deliver the football, even if maybe he doesn't quite know what's, exactly what's going on all the time. So he just has some natural things that you really like. And again, he's a really good learner. He's a really, really good learner. He's attacked it the right way this offseason. And look, this is about as healthy a quarterback situation as you can have in the year 2024. Like, does Garrett Nussmeyer have the skins on the wall that Jackson Dart has or Jalen Milrow has? No, not even Connor Wigman over in College Station. But he's talented. He has played a little and should be a quality starting quarterback. And then as far as backups go, like, who knows what you're going to have year to year. Guys transfer in and out of that position. It's like brushing your teeth. It happens all the time. Um, so to have A.J. Swan here to be able to do that and to have a, a, a guy that's been in the system two years and Ricky Collins, okay, that's fine. Um, and you bring in a really young talent in Colin Hurley, and we understand that Bryce Underwood would be next. So this is a pretty healthy spot that LSU is in uh, right now with the quarterback position, considering the year and the time that we're in. So that's Joe Sloan speaking to his quarterback spot. For all your LSU football content, go to Hunt on LSU on YouTube. We appreciate that. We're going to pause for Sports Center, when we come back, unfortunately, I will talk about LSU and Southern on the diamond. Maybe you want to hear that, but that's what I'm going to do. Matthew Bruni and Sharif Ishak to come in hour two as well. Come back with this Tuesday episode presented by Pluckers.
Center. I'm Christine Lisi. The expectation of the 76ers is that center Joel Embiid will return from meniscus surgery at some point this week, maybe even tonight versus the West leading Thunder. Embiid hasn't played in nine weeks. He'll likely benefit from all that time off once he does come back, explains ESPN NBA analyst Tim Legler. He'll have enough to get his stamina up to where now he can be able to play his normal minutes once you get into a, a, a potentially a seven-game series. He's going to feel literally like he does opening night hmm. when he finally takes the court for the 76ers, and certainly by the time he would take the court in a seven-game series against somebody and he gets you know six, seven games to get some of the rust off. Tim Legler on Greeny. The Sixers currently eighth in the East. Clippers forward Kawhi Leonard, right knee soreness, out tonight against the Kings. His status Thursday against Denver uncertain. After 16 NBA seasons, Rajon Rondo announced his retirement on the All the Smoke podcast last played in the 2021-2022 season with the Lakers and Cavaliers. McDonald's All-American and the number 26 prospect in the 2024 class guard Trent Perry decommitting from USC in light of coach Andy Enfield leaving for SMU. As humans, we like having options. One option you might like is speaking with a real person when you call about your credit card. With 24-7 live U.S.-based customer service from Discover, everyone can talk to a real person anytime, day, or night. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. Ladies and gentlemen, may I direct your attention to something quite extraordinary. Now, the Hunt Palmer Show. The Hunt Palmer Show on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Live from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge Studios. This is Hunt Palmer. Hour number two, Tuesday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show. Always brought to you by Pluckers Wing Bar. Speaking of Pluckers Wing Bar, tonight sports trivia, 8.30 at the Nicholson location. And for the first time in months, I will get to watch the Cubs during sports trivia, which always makes it a little more enjoyable. Unless, of course, the Cubs play like garbage, and then it makes it less enjoyable. But for now, I'll choose to be in a positive state of mind since they play the Rockies, and I think it will be a positive night at Pluckers on Nicholson. 8.30 sports trivia. Have you out of there by 10 o'clock. Come on by, grab a team, play for some gift cards, cold beers, some awesome wings. Always an enjoyable time. You know what's not an enjoyable time? Last night at the box, not enjoyable. Awful performance by LSU in every single aspect of the game of baseball. Well, how was the pitching? Well, it stunk. Gave up 11 hits and 12 runs. Well, how was the defense? Well, it stunk. You had three errors. Not great for run prevention. That's how Southern scores 12. Well, how was the offense? Well, it stunk. You got four hits. You left, let me do the math, 6,000 runners on base. Southern did what Southern does in these midweek games against LSU. They walked 11 guys, hit two more, and made two errors. <laughs> That's basically 15 free bases. And LSU's offense mounted four hits and scored seven runs. I- I'm not reacting to the two-and-a-half-hour window where LSU lost to Southern 12-7 to on a Monday night. I'm not reacting to that. I'm reacting to the totality of what we have seen from this team, specifically over the last month. Your offense went into the deep freeze in the final game of the last non-conference series. You did not play well in Starkville. You let one get away. In a weekend, you played okay against Florida, and then you got run-rolled at the end of it, and then you didn't do what you needed to do to win games in Fayetteville. And then you come back and you just, you laid an egg last night. When you play 56 of them, you're going to lay an egg. But when you pile on all this negative, all of a sudden, it feels worse. If you go to Starkville and win two out of three, and you play Florida and you win two out of three, and you go to Arkansas and you lose two out of three, but one of them's in extra innings, and you come out and you lay an egg to Southern, I don't think anybody's going to go nuts. Some people will because they don't feel like you should ever lose to an in-state team, but we're all well aware at this point that LSU is going to lose one or two of these in-state games every single year. They were awesome last year, and they lost to ULL and Nichols. But to play like that is disheartening. And so let me briefly go into some of the things from the game, 
and then I'll go into the bigger picture, which is what Jay Johnson had to say after the game, which is where this thing is seated right now. Um, the three errors were bad because Braswell's now made a handful of errors here in the last week and a half. Milo moved over to shortstop, and they hit him a tailor-made double play ball that would have been a huge momentum play late in the ball game, and he came up out of it like he was scared of the ball. It was just... That's the Steven Milam I saw in the fall, not the guy that's made so many quality plays at second base for this team. I still think he's going to be a good defensive player in college. I don't know that he is right now, and I certainly don't trust him to play shortstop right now. And then Brady Neal makes a really bad throw in the ninth inning and wings it down to the bullpen, and it costs you a couple runs. It's just, to me, kind of a lack of focus. I mean, Braswell just about fell down on a twisty ball, so that was just kind of a poor play. But Milam's got to get down and field the baseball. Neal's got to get out wide from from home plate and make a quality throw to first base in a huge spot in the game. He stayed near home plate and sailed it way wide of the bag. Jay came out and correctly asked, like, hey, can you look for interference because you're trying to do anything at that point to stay in the game? But it wasn't interference. It was a terrible throw. That stuff was... Pitiful. Kate Anderson, the stuff was good. He struck out six in two innings. Good fastball. Got some foolish swings with the breaking ball. But you put a couple of guys on via the base on balls. Left a fastball out over the outside part of the plate. And guy hit it in the seats. Dutton was good. Little didn't get an out. Lore got two outs but gave up two hits and three runs because he walked a guy. So that's not any good. And that's a guy you've definitely thought you were going to be able to count on as a left-hander. Thatcher Hurd wasn't as bad as his line indicates. Didn't get any help winging the ball down into the bullpen. But wasn't exactly dominant. So it, it, it was just bad from that perspective. And offensively, it, it was just just putrid. Four hits. Against Southern's midweek staff? You left 12 guys on base? Nine strikeouts? That's just very, very poor. They, they're they trying things. Bingham at leadoff. Bingham in the two-hole. White at leadoff. White in the two-hole. Ashton Larson hit third last night. He's been inserted in the lineup. You've seen... Ethan Fry in the outfield. You've seen Paxton Kling in the outfield. You've seen Josh Pearson in the outfield. You've seen Pearson at second. You've seen Milam at second. You've seen three guys catch. Browns played in the outfield. Like you've you've pushed every button there is to push. And there's just not been any response. And Jay Johnson said last night that they're going to change some consequences for some actions and that there's not a mindset that they need. And there's one piece of this that, that I I hesitate to harp on because I'm not there. I don't love it when beat reporters and radio talking heads and podcast hosts and people on Twitter speak to focus and speak to game plan and speak to chemistry and speak to camaraderie and all those types of things when how often are you really there? Like how much do you really know? Like I'll trust Chris Blair to tell me a story about the hotel in Omaha because he's there. Like you're, we're not in the team rooms. I don't know what's said pregame or in the team huddle. I don't know exactly what the game plan is against this pitcher or that pitcher. So for me to speak to that on a, with an, some sort of degree of authority I think sometimes it's disingenuous. But Jay's talking about it a little bit, and this is just very obvious. It's way easier to play with energy and to have great team chemistry and team camaraderie when things are going really well. That just comes naturally most of the time. If you're a great team that's winning a lot of games that hates each other, that that's your rare bird. Like That's pretty tough to do. But to, to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps to use an awful cliche, and and bring every bit of energy and effort and have the togetherness that it takes to be a great team when things are going south and you didn't expect them to is very difficult. 
I don't know exactly who the heart and soul of last year's team was. I could point to Cade Beloso and Gavin Dugas as, as guys that would make a lot of sense there. I think Dylan Cruz and Paul Skeens were such huge presences on the field that you couldn't help but draw energy from them. Jordan Thompson was a guy that all those guys really liked. Joe Bear had an edge and a confidence to him, but I think if this team was rattling off wins, as and I use air quotes here because I know it's not, but it looked that it looked easy for that team a lot of times. And I think if this team made it look that quote unquote easy, I think they'd have a lot of juice coming out of the dugout. They'd be fired up after wins. The fact of the matter is, you didn't win two out of three in Starkville. You couldn't close the deal and win two out of three in Gainesville. You got swept off the field in Fayetteville and had to fly all the way back home. And then you went out there. And you played pathetic baseball on a Monday. I don't know what goes on in the team room or study hall or film session or practice or weightliftings. Or, I don't know. So for me to speak to that directly would just be blowing smoke. But hopefully these guys do build a little bit of a bond and do come together and play better than they have. I still hold out hope that can happen. I'll tell you this. Some good stuff better happen on Thursday and Friday. If it doesn't, big trouble. If you go out there Thursday and Friday and lose 8-3 and 10-6, I don't know where you turn. This is a long season it's a sport that's a journey that I love so much, and I talk about it all the time. And there is still time as of April 2nd to make things work. But the margin for error is shrinking. Not because of last night's result. Not because of last night's result. Because of the play on the field for a month. And last night was the first time I heard Jay Johnson use some of these phrases and terminology talking about commitment, and energy, and those types of things. It just feels like they got to come together in a hurry. We'll see. LSU and Vandy coming up on Thursday. We'll certainly be previewing that. Our baseball breakdowns all year long are brought to you by Pluckers. Get in there and get some Breggy's Creole Crush. Alex Bregman inspired sauce with the um, seasoning that he's got. It's really, really good. I had a chance to sample it a couple of weeks ago. Got a little bit of heat to it, not too much. But a lot of really, really good flavor. You can get it on your wings, boneless or bone-in. Fantastic stuff. Get on by the Nicholson location, Blue Bonnet location. Get you some Breggy's Cree Old Clush. And, crush. and thanks to Pluckers for bringing you our baseball breakdowns all season long. All right, when we come back, we'll talk some women's basketball. They just got a huge commitment in the last 10 minutes. Matthew Bruni will tell you about it next. The Hunt Palmer Show. One Bath and Closets. OneBathandClosets.com is the website. David Duvall and his team redesigning and remodeling closets and bathrooms for 30 years. Here's the phone number. It's 225-400-8005. 400-8005. Give them a phone call. Go to the website OneBathandClosets.com and transform your living area at home. Whether it's the bathroom or the closet, they customize it to your exact specifications. If you've got a tub in your bathroom that you don't ever use, it's aging, it's ugly, and it doesn't function, well, take it out. Reclaim that square footage and put in a gorgeous glass walk-in shower. Changes the look and the, the uh, functionality of your bathroom. Adds a little value to your home. If you're struggling with your closet, don't have enough room, fighting that battle every single day, trying to get dressed in the morning, let David Duvall and his team come in and help you with that. Get the free consultation. Start the process today with One Bath and Closets. Check them out online, onebathandclosets.com. In times of need, get a full list of phone numbers, websites, and other important emergency information on the Demco Stormwatch page at 1045ESPN.com.
Matt Moscona inviting you to join us for Tuesday's AFR, powered by Sunshine, your hometown John Deere dealer in Louisiana. LSU, Iowa with a spot in the Final Four on the line. We're recapping the Tigers and Hawkeyes. Join us 3-6, to 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. One zero four five ESPN Baton Rouge and the Baton Rouge Clinic bring you the Dreams Come True Radiothon. Dreams Come True is an organization designed to help grant dreams for children with life-threatening illnesses and their families. The Dreams Come True Radiothon is pre- presented today by our own sponsor, Boudreaux Electric, Mid-City Title, and Unique Physique. Donate today at 1045ESPN.com. This is the Hunt Palmer Show on 1045 ESPN Baton Rouge. You know, it was a uh, tough night for Kim Mulkey's LSU Tiger program. They exit the NCAA tournament in the round of eight. Iowa and Caitlin Clark moving on to the final four. Matthew Bruni covered the LSU Lady Tigers all the way this year and joins us now. Of course, Matthew from On3, part of the Bengal Tiger crew. Matthew, how are you? Hey, Hunt. Doing well. Staying busy. And, uh, yeah, just for wrapping up the, the season. Well, they got some good news within the last hour. So fill us in on a new site or a new commitment for Kim Mulkey's crew before we get into LSU and Iowa from last night. Yeah, LSU picked up 2025 guard uh, Bella Hines, the number 31 player in the 2025 class. Uh, one of the best scorers in the class, one of the best shooters in the class, and um, someone out of New Mexico that I think you know in a couple of years uh, will be a really really nice for them uh, as far as scoring and shooting goes. So, um, yeah, good get for them. First one of the 2025 class. Um, they missed on a couple of 2024s that they were high on, and so it's good to get, good for them to get, you know, back in it uh, in the 25 class. So a little bit of good news, but of course overshadowed by last night's game. Uh, what was the biggest reason that Iowa won the game last night? Caitlin Clark. Yep, that's what um, I said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whatever you're you know, we can talk about this a lot of different ways, but at the end of the day, Caitlin Clark controlled the game. She controlled the pace. Um, she was able to advance the ball very quickly um, and put LSU in scramble positions. Um, her ball out of ball screens, LSU, you know, was kind of a step slow at times. And then ultimately, even when they weren't a step slow, she hit, you know, step back behind the back three from 26 feet out. And nobody else is doing that in in the college game, in men's or women's. Nobody's hitting those shots consistently. And uh, I said coming in, you know, over the past 10 games, she shot 32% from three. The past six games, she shot 28% from three. She'd really kind of been struggling. And this this was a game she obviously got right. And I said going into it, if she just goes nuclear, I don't I don't think I'm, you can can match it. And that's what happened. <laughs> 41 points and 12 assists for Caitlin Clark. I think nuclear certainly does apply. What did you think about the way that LSU tried to defend her? Yeah, I think it's fair for people to question it consistently. I was surprised to start the game that Haley um, was the one that they designated on her. Um, I thought the theory was a couple different things. One was to try to keep Plage out of foul trouble. We saw we saw last year Poa check in and get two quick fouls. I think that really concerned Mulkey and them to if they to get flushing at foul trouble. Um, so they started Haley on her, and I think the second reason is Haley did a fine job off ball defending Kaylin. Like she stayed attached, but obviously once she got the ball and was able to blow right by Haley, I think the help needed to just be better. They needed to be sharper in their rotations, and they weren't. So, um, and I do think some of that is Angel Reese also getting injured, but. Um, ultimately, I think they should have changed it up in the second half or you know, once Caitlin got going, you had to throw something else at her. You know, LSU offensively kept pace except for that stretch in the third quarter. What did you see go wrong for LSU offensively in the third quarter when I was able to separate? Yeah, that was that was really the, the, the dagger that that third quarter. You just can't have quarters like that. I think uh, a couple things. Um, I don't think they shot a ton of threes, but they definitely settled on a couple possessions where they had to get buckets. 
and you just can't really have that. Um, the struggles of, you know, Anissa, and I think Angel with that ankle in the third quarter just really wasn't able to move as well as she, she was. I think she went one of eight in that quarter. Yeah. Um, as a team, five of 26 in the quarter and kind of a, a theme for the game that I also wrote about was we knew they'd get offensive rebounds. They grabbed 23 offensive rebounds, but they only scored 14 points on those possessions. So 14 points on 23 possessions is just not good enough. Um, they had to get in the, the mid twenties and, you know, you, you want to score one point per possession on those offensive rebounds usually just to, and that would have kept them afloat a bit longer and they just weren't able to convert at the rim. Take everything into account from the start to the finish of this season. Um, how will uh, you uh, you recall this one? Uh, one of the craziest seasons. I mean, I can remember just from start to finish being ranked number one to start the year. Uh, obviously, then Samaya going down seven games in. I mean, that's their starting center. Um, and I knew at that point it was going to be tough. And then Angel and Kateri Poole get suspended for a couple weeks. Kateri gets kicked off the team. Angel comes back. Haley gets hurt for a month um, with her foot, and they still manage to have a really successful conference season. And um, more, and obviously, more and more eyeballs on LSU just throughout the entire year. And the Kim Mulkey saga to to end the to end the year yeah. in the conference tournament. They had the fight against South Carolina. Um, man, it was just it's. There's never a dull moment. I say that all the time to anybody I'm talking to, but it's, this year just encapsulated that. And then a great win over UCLA in the tournament. I mean, that is a really, really impressive win. And to get back to an Elite Eight, uh, considering the lack of depth they had, the two players that weren't on the team, any, or somebody was on the team, but Katir getting kicked off as well. I mean, just to make it that far, I think is a really, really successful year. All right, now we know that everybody on this roster has eligibility remaining. They could all return. Uh, where do you think uh, there will be departures? Yeah, I, I think Haley Van List will move on, uh, whether that's the pros or whether that's transferring. I just can't fully see it, uh, see her coming back. I think anybody who's, who's watched her even just play a game or two uh, kind of understands just it wasn't a fit. And she tried her best, and I give her a lot of credit for just putting her nose down and trying, but... Um, I would assume that she would move on uh, one way or the other. Uh, Angels, the iffy one. I think I, I've written about this the past couple weeks, but I, I do think there's a little bit more of a concerted effort from LSU to try to get Angel to come back. Now, if that ends up happening, you know, the, the ball is in, L in Angel's court, so she'll do whatever she, she sees fit. But LSU definitely would love to have her back, obviously, as an All-American. Um, I'm 50-50 on her, and then, you know, We'll see. Um, and maybe any of the freshmen that didn't get to play a bunch, maybe Angelica Velez or Janae Kent or any of them, they're unhappy at all. You know, we could see. But overall, you really just need to keep, obviously, Flage, who I don't think is going anywhere, um, Michaela, who I don't think is going anywhere, and Anissa Morrow. Those are your core three. And then, you know, you kind of build from there, hopefully with Angel as well. You think Angel Reese will have her number retired? Yes. Yes, uh, two-time All-American, uh, national champ, first national champ in basketball history, the, the MVP of that team. Uh, yes, there's, yeah, I don't have any questions about jersey retirement. I'm with you there as well. Uh, first ever, or sort of third ever Southeastern Conference Player of the Year for the women, and the other two are already up in the Raptors with Simone and uh, Sylvia. So I'm, I'm right there with you uh, as well. Matthew, we appreciate you uh, keeping us covered with the ladies uh, all year long. And, uh We'll be locked into the Bengal Tiger moving forward as they try to reassemble a team that uh, can get back to this point and maybe a little bit further. Yeah, should be a fun offseason. Thanks, Hunt. He's Matthew Bruni, part of the Bengal Tiger over on three. Shay Dixon and Billy Embody do an awesome job with football and recruiting coverage. And Matthew uh, covers the team for the most part um, with, uh, with the basketball teams, baseball and football as well, although he does dip into the uh, recruiting waters with, uh, with basketball. And as you mentioned at the top of that interview, LSU secures a 2025 commitment uh, in women's basketball from a top 35 player in the country, big score out of New Mexico. So appreciate him for coming in and keeping us updated with all of that. All right, so our Tuesday shows are brought to you by Pluckers. When we come back, Sharif Ishak talking the Pels as well as the New Orleans Saints. This is the Hunt Palmer Show. You are now listening to the Hunt Palmer Show. 
Boudreaux's Electric. Give yourself the peace of mind. I know the power's not going to go out. Power going out, not good. Um, my wife, not a big fan of the power going out. Went out for one of those hurricanes a couple years ago, and she just drove to Shreveport and stayed at my parents' house. She's just not dealing with it. Well, now we live in the new house. We're going to get a Generac generator put in there. We're not going to have to worry about it, and you won't either. If you work from home and can't stand the power going out because one of these summer thunderstorms comes through, Boudreaux's Electric. Generac generator. They can have it installed at your home. If you're a business owner, have multiple properties. Generac generator. Make sure that everything's running, even if the hurricane season comes through one of those summer showers, or like we saw in January, an ice storm comes on in. 985-397-1562. 985-397-1562. Get a Generac generator installed at your home or business as quickly as possible to give yourself that peace of mind. You can do it with the folks at Boudreaux's Electric. Our listeners fire up their opinions on the jimsfirearms.net hotline at 499-1045. Keep listening for your next chance to shoot us your thoughts with the jimsfirearms.net hotline on 1045 ESPN Baton Rouge. to start dancing in the desert. It's the 2024 NCAA Men's Final Four in Phoenix. Tune in for live coverage starting Saturday afternoon at 3. From the team at Westwood One right here on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. See where you stand on the leaderboard for the Million Dollar Bracket Challenge powered by Acura of Baton Rouge and Coors Light at 104.5 ESPN.com. Just the final four left to go, and whoever gets first place will win $2,024 in cash, and second place gets a 75-inch TV and soundbar. 
and third place, not least at all, gets a two-night stay at the Beau Rivage. Maybe you see Jimmy out there uh, by ch half and chance. It's the Million Dollar Bracket Challenge, powered by Acura of Baton Rouge and Coors Light. You are listening to The Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Plucker's Wing Bar. Maybe see Jimmy Ott? I mean, I'll tell you this. Last, I went to the Beau Rivage. Last time I was there was the bye weekend last year, October. I saw Jimmy Ott and Charles Haniger. Okay, so, so so you have a substantially good chance of seeing You have a great there. chance to see Jimmy Ott. That's, that's got to entice some people. I got UConn winning it. That's pretty good. That's not that's, bad. I went way out on a limb there. I was like, yeah, I think I think UConn's good. We'll I, pick them. My Final Four is completely gone on the, on the uh, on that bracket. So I don't remember any of the other three teams. You had Creighton, Bay I think. Creighton, Baylor, Houston, I think. Yeah, that's that's no good. I did not have Jamal Shedd getting hurt. That's not my fault. Not watching that much college basketball outside of the SEC, kind of my fault. But I did pick UConn, so we'll see if that uh, that works out. Speaking of basketball, uh, Pels lose to Phoenix last night, 124-111. Devin Booker scored 300 points, as he often does. against Arena, that's two straight 52-point games inside that arena. I mean, whenever you play soft defense on him, that's what he does. He absolutely just damages your team. And he had 25 points the last time in the first quarter, had 24 points yesterday in the first quarter. I mean, he just loves playing in this arena, just loves playing against the Pelicans. It feels like ever since that windmills 360 slam dunk he did zion did it on his son so devin booker's had it out for the pels well last time we talked to you uh the pels were going into a long home stand and we feel like they needed to to do to make some hay here but it was against good teams lost to oklahoma city uh by seven beat milwaukee by seven and then have dropped consecutive games to boston and phoenix on saturday and monday uh your thoughts on the pels in that four game stretch not good not, not good. good at all not good i mean I'll throw the Boston game away because they absolutely punish every team they face with the best record in the NBA, best team in the NBA, until they get into the playoffs. But, <laughs> look, the Thunder game, they, they fought hard. They, they had they had a five-point lead with about 310 left, scoreless, 12-zip run. Couldn't get any offense generated. On the opposite end of it, the Milwaukee game, Zion became aggressive down the stretch in crunch time, and, and they closed it out really strong. Zion had 11 points in the fourth quarter. Boston... They started great, and then it just went downhill from there. Yesterday, it, 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 it never even they never even started. I mean, Devin Booker started and finished the game. I mean, that's all it was. The offense just – it's now you're starting to see how much they miss Brandon Ingram, a guy who can – you know, a playmaker who generates, you know, for himself and others. And you're starting to see how much it's taking a toll on them, and they need him back as, as quick as possible because one in three against, you know, the playoff contending teams in this run, and this is exactly like – the time that they should be playing their best basketball and showing everyone their the real deal and the playoff contenders and they have not shown that at all except for that one game against the Bucks. So we, we thought kind of maybe okay BI's out and that's that's not ideal. We want BI in the game, but with him out, Zion kind of take control as the primary ball handler and he may be able to create a little bit more than he did with BI taking his fair share of the shots. Zion's led the team in scoring in in all four of the games at home, and he's averaging right at 30 points in those games. But what does it look like when you're watching? Is it not as efficient as with Bi in there? Yeah, it's it's I mean, it's not efficient because he doesn't take the jump shots that you know that they give him. Uh, they're giving him the opportunity to take those mid range jumpers, but that's not his game. He's a let me get to the basket, left the right side of the basket, and get a get to the rim, score, or get a foul. Um, and that's where you're like missing Ingram. I mean. Also, there are times whenever the centers are just dropping underneath the basket and just doesn't recognize it, and you know the rest of the team isn't recognizing it. And they're not splashing and they're not, you know, getting to the basket. And it's it's just one on five at times, and the other team just watching. And it's, it's plain and simple that everyone's just watching Zion at times. And I just feel like the motion needs to be in the, in place whenever he has the ball in his hand, and they need to take it. It's going to be under the. Well, if he plays and make sure he can, you know, take down a guy like Nurkic. But it's just hit a wall, ton. It has hit a wall on this home stand so far, and you know it's unfortunate because now they only have a one game lead over the Suns yeah. with that six five. Play Phoenix coming up uh, next Sunday, April the seventh. Uh, going up this Sunday, April the seventh, um, in in Phoenix as part of the start of a long road trip. Do we have any update on Brandon Ingram to this point? Yeah, you know, we were out there. We were out of practice today. He was just taking some, you know, warm-up shots. He was just warming up, no contact. Um, Jose Alvarado the same. 
nothing much more than that. Uh, I, maybe the last couple games of the season for Brandon Ingram, last two or three games of the regular season, he'll be back. Um, you got to hope that he's back by then because they're des- desperately, desperately going to need him but before hopefully not playing in, uh, in a playoff game. Got a thought on the game against Orlando Wednesday night? <sighs> Man, look. They've, they've beaten them six straight times in the Smoothie King Center. They've beaten them four straight times overall. It's just, once again, Hunt, bad matchup. And Paulo Bancaro, I mean, Jalen Suggs had like a career game against them a couple weeks ago. I don't know. I, I just don't know. I just don't feel, I don't feel good. I don't feel good about the game against the Magic without Brandon Ingram. You feel it's good just, about the game with San Antonio? Nah, I mean, they're out. They're, two of their guys are hurt. Right. Sohan and and you know, they'll just have to stop Victor Wimbanyama. And yeah, I feel good about that one. But two and four on this homestand is a nightmare. This is exactly what I said they did. They they couldn't afford to do is go two and four. At the minimum, it needs to be three and three. And they better you know find a way to to to, to play four quarters as cliche as it is and start fast because there's a chance that it might be two and four. They don't win tomorrow. Well, I sense your tone, but they got three home games left, four road games left when they go out west for that last road trip. Uh, do you think they can avoid the play-in? Um, as sitting right now, I just I, I just don't like the way they're playing. I mean, I, I really don't like the way they're playing from on both ends of the court, Hunt. I mean, they're going to have to play Sacramento. They're beat up. Monk is out. Herter's out. The Lake, uh, that Lakers last game, they have to play the Warriors, which is never an easy place to play. So, uh, man, the Suns, I don't know, man. They're, they're going to have to go 4-3. and three. That that is just my gut feeling. They got to get to forty nine. They get to forty nine. They avoid it. All right. We'll see if they can. Uh, they can do it. Uh, I spent some time talking about the uh, the Saints and and whether or not they're going to add um, free agency at the offensive line positions. They've done it once. What do you think about Andrews Pete? Do you think he could could return? Man, that's a, I think a question everybody's getting. Could he return, or should they even entertain having him sign? Line is beat up. It's the Biggest question mark going into this offseason is that offensive line and, of course, the defensive line. Should they? Yeah, he played well last year. He, whenever they needed him to move around on the offensive line, he played, and he was pretty much healthy for the whole season. I'd entertain it, yeah, at a, at a certain cost. I would entertain bringing him back, yeah. I mean, just because of based off what he did last year, this team needs, team needs help. Team needs help along that offensive line. I'd bring him back. But listen, don't be surprised if those first two picks offensive tackles in the NFL draft. Do not be surprised. Do you think they would be drafting them to play as rookies? I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you're drafting guy for a uh, number 14, he's going to start. I mean, there may no, there, there may need be no, like there's there, no way around it. They need uh, tackles. You, your pinning isn't <laughs> working out and Sam check is hurt. I mean, they need tackles to come in and play right away. They do. Uh, they're curious if they're going to do that in free agency or, or address it multiple times in the draft, as as you're suggesting. Um, are you concerned about LSU's baseball team? I can't believe you asked me that question. <laughs> uh, yes, 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 and yes. How and concerned? You more, you're seeing it more than I do. I haven't watched as many games as you have. I watched, I watched one game against Arkansas. No, I watched the Thursday and Friday games. I didn't watch the Saturday game because I went and watched the Celtics Pelicans. Did not see last night until I saw the score and I was like, oof. <laughs> it was worse. I mean, it was worse than you could have imagined. Uh, but I mean, look, I mean, with the pitching, hitting, I mean, it's everything, Hunt. The defense. I, I'm so I, I'm so surprised with the pitching. I am really surprised how bad the pitching has been. I don't know. Maybe you could correct me. Am I wrong on that? Has the pitching been Pitching has been that, underwhelming um, for the most yeah. part. I mean, look, Gage Jump and uh, Luke Holman were sensational in the non-conference. We've gotten a conference play, and outside of Holman against Florida, it's been rather pedestrian. Yeah, I mean, you bring in Nate Yeski, and I thought it was going to be much better than that. And Maybe next season it will, or maybe by the end of the year it will, because I understand, cliche, long season. So far, I mean, look, I saw that the schedule so far hasn't been kind in the SEC play, but... Also, some of the, it just has been underwhelming. It, the competition level has been a little underwhelming to me. Just just the eye test, it's just not looking, not looking good. Maybe, try, maybe it gets better against Vandy. I don't know. Yeah, we're trying to get you to Omaha. I'm just I'm just letting you know. We're going to try to figure out what we can do. Hey, man, I, I did all I could do last year <laughs> on the field. I don't know, man. Maybe maybe that was my maybe that was my you know 
my, my swan song, maybe that was it for me, that, that trip to Omaha. Let's hope not. We're planning on going back this June, but we'll see. Things aren't looking super awesome right now. We'll talk next week, Sharif. Thanks. Not looking super awesome everywhere right now, so hopefully it gets better. Hopefully it gets better. Hope springs eternal. It is spring. That's Sharif Ishak from WDSU, our New Orleans correspondent, checking in on the uh, the Pels, Saints, and a little bit of LSU baseball. There's Sharif. Sharif loves him some Omaha. He loves going to Omaha. Um, this group does not look destined for Omaha at the moment, but maybe that changes on Thursday. Hope springs eternal. All right, let's close it up next. The Hunt Palmer Show. ESPN Bet, ready to take you through all the huge sports moments this spring. The exclusive sports book of ESPN has it all, including offers and promotions from Scott Van Pelt and Stephen A. Smith. From the playoff intensity to getting out on the links to out to the ballpark, no better time to be a sports fan. New users get $100 in bonus bets for making any sports book bet. That couldn't be any simpler. You download the ESPN Bet app, you create your account, you put money in, I put $5 in, you make your bet, $100 right there in your account for your disposal. Download ESPN Bet today. What a play. Must be 21 or older. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700. In partnership with the Bears like Charles. Terms and conditions apply. See app for details. In times of need, get a full list of phone numbers, websites, and other important emergency information on the Demco Stormwatch page at 1045ESPN.com. Bench with Jacob Hester and T. Bob Abear. Mornings from 7 to 10 on 1045 ESPN Baton Rouge.
This is the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Plucker's Wing Bar. I'll be at Plucker's tonight, 8.30 for sports trivia. If you've never been, come on out tonight. It's a lot of fun. Put a team together or come by yourself. A uh, team, probably more fun and advantageous to you as a trivia crew. But uh, we do some sports trivia, five rounds, live action trivia. You can win Plucker's gift cards, drink some ice cold draft beer, eat some delicious wings, including Breggy's Creole Crush, which is fantastic stuff. Uh, and we always have a good time on Tuesdays. We have you out of there by 10 o'clock. We'll be watching the Cubbies, uh, some NBA basketball as well. So come on out to Pluckers on Nicholson tonight. Um, Jeff Landry has apparently spoken out about um, LSU's women not being on the floor for the national anthem last night. Um, Kim Mulkey was asked about it in a press conference, said she didn't even know when the anthem was played. They've got a routine. They leave the floor at 12-minute mark. They do the pregame stuff. They come on back out, and it wasn't anything. It was intentionally done. Um, but Landry took to Twitter and said, my mother coached women's high school basketball during the height of desegregation. No one has a greater respect for the sport and for Coach Mulkey. However, above respect for that game is a deeper respect for those that serve to protect us and unite under one flag. He continued on Twitter. It's loading on my site. But he continued on uh, to say, it's time that all college boards, including region, put a policy in place that student-athletes be present for the national anthem or risk their athletic scholarship. It's a matter of respect that all collegiate athletes should, coaches should instill. I will say the same thing about this that I said about Colin Kaepernick, that I said about Drew Brees, that I said about whatever we're talking about with the national anthem. I just don't care what you do during the national anthem. You can be in the locker room. You can stand up and salute. You can sing. You can go get a hot dog. You can go to the bathroom and mix your drink. I just, I don't care what you do during the national anthem. I personally stand up, put my hand over my heart, and sing the national anthem. If you want to take a knee, like, I, I don't care. And I certainly don't think that we need to be pulling scholarships because people aren't out of the locker room for the national anthem as a team. Keep in mind, the football team is not out there either. They're in the locker room. It's just creating controversy that doesn't need to be created. Can we just play some sports? I, I just, can we worry about things that politicians should actually worry about instead of jump into Twitter, firing off a tweet saying that let's pull scholarships? I, just politics is a tough scene, man. Just trying to grab any scrap and claw you can to create some controversy and get folks on your side and not on their side. It's just so divisive and I just don't like it. Let's do some take it or leave it. All right, first one here. Eric Musselman is set to interview with USC for that mm. vacancy. Must bus out west. Take it or leave it. I'll take it. That'd be I'll great. Take I think Arkansas has got a good coach. He's had a, a good program there that's made some deep tournament runs. He recruits very well. He coaches pretty well. Um, and I'd love it if he went to Southern Cal. Big Ten team out on the West Coast. Um, there have been some rumors over the last two months that he was kind of looking for the escape hatch. Now, this would be hilarious if he did take this job because he and Hunter Juracek just did a video on Twitter making this big spoof about how he's staying. He's like, all oh, aboard the bus, and Muslim said, you're still here? Like, whole Twitter thing, which would be hilarious if a week and a half later he decided, hey, I'm actually going to leave. Um, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, I would, I'll be curious to see how that shakes out. The Georgia Bulldogs hunt will play for a chance to make the NIT final tonight. Oh, baby! Against Seton Hall. The Pirates are four and a half point favorites in Hinkle Fieldhouse, where they won't be playing the final in the gar in the garden anymore. It's Correct. gonna be at gonna be at Hinkle. So anyway, the Bulldogs will get the W. Take it or leave it. Uh, I'll leave it. I don't think they're very good. I don't know anything about Seton Hall. Not a one thing. A lot of people thought that. they should have made the tournament. Okay, well, then they're better than Georgia, who's not good and should not have made the tournament. Um, I, 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 there's there there's luster off the NIT taken out of the garden. At least that's yeah. like a, a carrot to dangle at the end. Yeah, Jimmy Chitwood made a shot at Hinkle Fieldhouse when they were filming Hoosiers. That's super cool. But I don't think anybody really cares about going to Indianapolis and playing in that thing. I think they'd rather be in the Garden. I understand why Madison Square Garden may not want it, and the whole luster of the NIT is really struggling at this point. Um, I didn't know it was still going on, but uh, shout-out to the dogs. Go get them. All right, next one here. LSU women's golfers Ingrid Lindblad and Latana Stone enter the Augusta National Women's Amateur this week as two of the favorites to win. Lindblad and Stone over the field. Take it or leave it? Take it. I'll take they it. They have played very well in this event. Now, God, they now since they've played Augusta a couple times in tournament format, like it's not 
maybe as big a deal like as you're trying to reach that star for the first time. But you've got to go to the other golf course in Augusta to play for two days to qualify for the final round at Augusta National. But they've both been very good. They're among the top amateurs in the world. I know that Ingrid is the top amateur uh, in the world, so I'll be pulling for them. We had Ingrid on this show last year after she played in it because they play the Saturday right before the Masters. So it's a really cool situation for them to, to be able to do that. Hopefully they... Uh, they, uh, they play well, and they get a chance to play Augusta once again. Uh, and we'll get into Masters Week next week. So shout out to those two who have been incredible rep- representatives uh, of LSU and women's golf. All right, last one here. The Houston Astros got swept by the Yankees in their opening season series. And then Ronel Blanco, in his eighth career start, yep. threw a no-hitter in the Astros 10-0 win over the Blue Jays. There's something in the water for these Astros pitchers. Take it or leave it. I mean, you got to take it. I'll Maybe take it's it. Breggy's Creole Crush from Maybe. Pluckers that they've got sprinkled into the water. I mean, they have they've been on a no hitters roll. Individual no hitters, team no hitters. They're throwing as many. They're throwing more no hitters than anybody in baseball. Um, I don't know if that has anything to do with trash cans or not. Is that is that too soon with the, with the uh, trash cans? I mean, <laughs> considering <laughs> considering it involved the hitters, I mean, it kind of doesn't even make any that, sense. No, but it it's okay. That's all right. Uh, no, I, that's uh, it's cool stuff. I uh, I saw a no hitter in. Uh, Minute Maid Field, it was absolutely terrible. It was Oklahoma against LSU. And people were saying, hey, were you so happy that you got to see a no-hitter? And I was like, no, because that was my team that got no-hit. It sucked. Uh, so I did not like seeing a no-hitter. Um, I like seeing Jared Poche's no-hitter in Alec Box Stadium. That was far more enjoyable to me. Uh, but cool, the Astros got a no-hitter. Um, tough start for them, but they're off and running now, and I'm sure they'll be the favorites to win the ALS. All right, that'll do it for our show here on this Tuesday, brought to you by Pluckers Wing Bar. Excited for tomorrow's show. We'll have Koki Riley on. Uh, Koki covers the baseball team for the Advocate, and we'll see what he thought of uh, Jay Johnson's comments after the loss against Southern. Does it, that seem like a change in, in tenor from the head man over there in, uh, in purple and gold? We'll certainly do What If Wednesday tomorrow as well, uh, and we're going to hear from Joe Sloan some more sound from the LSU offensive coordinator who met with the media earlier today. We'll talk about tight end position, some of the offensive line, how much of Mike Denbrock's offense is still going to be in. Uh, So we'll do a lot of that with Joe Sloan audio tomorrow. Very much looking forward to that. Hope to see you at Pluckers tonight. If you missed any of our show, catch it on demand. 1045ESPN.com's On Demand tab. All of our shows are archived there every single day. It's off the bench, live at lunch, Hunt Palmer show, after further review, all at 1045ESPN.com. If you prefer the app scene, Spotify, um, Google, podcast app, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your stuff, you can find us. Just search Hunt Palmer Show, like, subscribe, rate, and review. Open the show, talking LSU and Iowa. Lady Tigers are done for the spring. NFL rumors, what are the Saints going to do offensive line? That was at 115. You can also find it at Hunt on Saints on YouTube. Glenn West from Go 24-7, talking football and baseball. We briefly heard from Joe Sloan and LSU's quarterbacks. My reaction to LSU and Southern, that breakdown brought to you by Pluckers. Matthew Bruni talking women's basketball and Sharif on the New Orleans Sports Saints and Pels. Go check that out on demand. Matt Moscone is going to drive you home on After Further View. I'm back tomorrow, same time, same place. It's the Hunt Palmer Show.